some order at uh, 906. Please do the roll call. Jared Rickey? Present. Nelson Cantrell? Present. Jeff Foss? Here. Harold Perry? Here. You'll listen. Here. I'd like to stand and ask for a moment of silence in particular for those of you who are so inclined to prayers for the five children who are from the Boyles Parish who were recently killed in the uh, trip to uh, Disney World. States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We move to item four on the agenda, which is an opportunity to address the Commission. We have one request to address the Commission. Uh, relative to an item on the agenda, and that was by Mr. Leon Bucking yet. Mr. Yet, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, Leon B. Yet, 114 Magnolia Street, Lake Arthur, Louisiana. Uh, uh, item on the agenda today is an election of officers. I come before this commission today with a heavy, heavy heart. I would rather be anywhere else than in this commission room today. Wish I didn't have to be here. But in my heart of hearts, I believe I'm here for a purpose. I believe I've been here for a purpose for almost three years now. Uh, the reason my comments are so important, I believe it will reflect on today's commission business of uh, nominating and electing new officers. I am in a, want to file a formal complaint with this commission, and I'd like the time to read it into the record if I may. Is it? I certainly will indulge you. How long is it? It's a page and a, page and a half. All right, go ahead. And of course, it's addressed to Mr. Hanlon from me. Dear Mr. Hanlon, please accept this. And I want y'all to understand before I go any further, this is nothing personal. This is a professional decision that I've made that I think will take the politics out of this commission and out of the state police, which I have very much against and have been from the, my initial complaint. Mr. Hamlin, please accept this correspondence as a formal request pursuant to State Police Commission Rule Chapter 16, Investigations. I am requesting State Police Commission to investigate allegations of violations of law, State Police Commission rules, and the Louisiana Constitution by three of the seven members of the State Police Commission. Mr. Ulysses Simeon, Jr., Mr. Jerry J. Carrique, and Chief Harold Petrie Sr. Specifically, I allege violation of the Louisiana State Constitution, Article 10, Section 47A, and SPC Rules 42, 14.2A, 1, 14.2A4, and 14.2A8 obtained from public records maintained by the Louisiana Ethics Administration Program Computerized Data Management System. Article 10, Section 47A provides that no member of the commission and no state police officer in a classified service shall participate or engage in political activity, make or solicit contributions for any political activity, make or solicit contributions for any political party, faction, or candidate, except to exercise his right as a citizen to express his opinion privately and to, and to case his vote to cast his vote as he desires. State Police Commission Rule 14.2A1 provides that no member of the State Police Commission and no classified member of the State Police Service shall participate or engage in political activity, including, including but not limited to, any effort to support or oppose the election of a candidate for political office or support or oppose a particular polit political party or faction. Members of the Commission are expressly prohibited from making or soliciting contributions for any political purpose, party, faction, or candidate. SPC Rule 14.2A4. Mr. 
Members of the commission are expressly prohibited from participating in political activity directly or indirectly by paying or promising to pay any assessment, subscription, or contribution to any political party, faction, or candidate. State Police Commission Rule 4288. The law specifically, the Louisiana Constitution Article 10, Section 47, and State Police Commission Rule 142 are both clear. Members of the State Police Commission are expressly prohibited from participating in political activity. These members should resign their positions immediately. Barring voluntary resignation, I see no alternative but to have the governor call a public hearing. Leon B. Miet, and I please see the copy to the governor. I also have included with this, I have an attachment of the candidate's report from the Ethics Commission, which will back and support um, contributions to political parties by the three members in question. And I thank you for hearing my complaint, and I'll submit a copy of this to the Yeah, I, I'd love to see what it is I'm alleged to have. Okay, speak for myself, but I think I'm religiously under that roof. So am I, and so is my wife, even though we are separate in property. This, this, these came off the electronic side of the Ethics Commission. So it's not something that I produced, it's something that I... Mr. Chairman, I will happily, happily respond in writing to this commission, in writing for this false allegation against me. And I would suggest that all of the commissions are implicated by uh, this allegation uh, do the same. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, I assume he's going to make copies of all those for yes. the commission. Yes, I'll provide a copy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. for comments uh, relative to anything on the agenda, although Mr. Miette does have a request uh, to discuss an uh, item not on the agenda, which we'll get to a little bit later. Okay. The next order of business is election of officers uh, per uh, State Police Commission Rule 2.1B. We have any motions to, to nominate any persons for chair? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would nominate you with Simeon. Nelson Control? Yes. 
Jeffrey Falls? Yes. December 13, 2018 minutes. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. So moved. second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll just take a uh, we'll take a roll call vote. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Jason, can you show me his abstaining since I wasn't here? I should have been minutes because I wasn't here. That'd be sure. Yeah. Um, with one abstention, anyone opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a request of Louisiana State Police from the Louisiana State Police for reinstatement of 387.34 hours of sick leave for State Trooper Michael Hughes, and that would be pursuant to State Police Commission Rule 11.21.1b. That's, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, rule provides that the director may approve the reinstatement of uh, sick leave for a trooper that was injured in the line of duty uh, up to a limit of hours, um, which is 1,040. Uh, I approve that under my own authority. Uh, any balance must go to the commission for consideration. And so the balance is before you today. So this is in addition to what you've already approved. Correct. And as I understand, uh, when a, a trooper is injured in the line of duty uh, and has to take uh, sick leave, it's been customary to approve reinstatement of that sick leave. Yeah. Correct, under the rules, chapter 11. Uh, is there any motion relative to the request of the state police? I'll move to approve. Check. Okay, any discussion? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Black, Commissioner. The, uh, Vice Chairman. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to apologize. I, I was on schedule to be here timely, but there's a uh, railroad across Florida, <laughs> and I was sitting there 10 minutes and then realized that time was eroding and it reversed for direction again, and I said, I'm going to go around. So I apologize. Um, is there a reason why? Sick leave wasn't just paid uh, uh, in total, or it was under he was under workers' compensation. Workers' comp, correct. And there there are workers' comp indemnity payments that are made to 
reinstate lost sick leave or used leave um, for the employee, but it's done at a partial rate. It's not done at a one-to-one -one ratio. And so uh, the result of his substantial injuries, um, he, he, he ended up using a uh, So he was, he was compensated fully under workers' compensation. No. A, a partial rate. He was he, he used his current he used his leave and then workers' comp indemnity payments supplemented the use of that leave, but not on a one to one ratio. So he was still using <coughs> leave for the duration of his uh, his injury. And now it's my understanding that he is still out of injured. Um, it, it was a pretty severe injury. So the leave was used up and we're Actually, considering reinstating the leave so we would have it available to make him whole. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Item number uh, six, uh, subparagraph four, is a public hearing to consider proposed uh, changes to chapter 13 and 16 of the state uh, uh, police commission rules. And there was a general circular which was issued, uh, general circular one, number 195, that was issued. And uh, Mr. Hanneman would ask that you uh, verify that that circular was timely issued so that we can consider this matter at this time. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. On December 21st, 2018, I issued a revised copy of general circular 195, which included incorporated the comments uh, received prior to that time and through some other comments received through the, the uh, Mr. Falcon, Mr. R, uh, and actually Mr. Mie. So that was incorporated in the rise, revised issue on December 21st. Um, so it's, we'll take chapter 13 now. Are there any uh, public comments relative to the proposed changes? Uh, good morning, Floyd Falcon on behalf of Cooper's Association. Good morning, Mr. Falcon. How are you doing this morning? We did uh, meet with the chairman and with the Hanneman, I think it was December 31st, it was right before Christmas, uh, <coughs> the 21st rather. But in, in any event, we, we had quite a bit of discussions uh, regarding uh, the proposed changes. Uh, I had written an opposition to some of them, and some of those had been re uh, resolved, but I still have a, a, a number of issues with uh, some of the changes, and I, I don't know how y'all want to deal with this, if you want to go over that. Um, do you have a copy of the circular? I do. Okay, why don't you tell us the page that, that you're referring to, and we'll try to follow along. The rule number that you have an issue with, and, and uh, the page number. While you get that together, let me get part of the First comment I have is about chapter. Uh, excuse me, rule on page uh, one, rule thirteen point one a. Uh, the uh, proposed changes uh, 
further limit uh, the definition of discrimination, if you look at chapter, at chapter one, the definition section, uh, discrimination is considered to be uh, consideration, appointment, approval, discipline, or other action which adversely affects a probationary or permanent employee who is based on a non-merit -fact factor relating to the employee's religious, political beliefs, gender, or race. The language in the new rule or the proposed new rule is different from that, uh, and I believe rule the discrimination definition remains the same, so it seems to be a conflict there in the, in the two. But one of the, the main thing is this, the, the, the definition talks about non-merit factors. That's not in the 13.1a. Uh, it also relates to probationary and permanent employees. And I believe that uh, if you look at the, the tenor of the rest of the the proposed changes, we're taking away the rights of applicants, applicants and probationary employees to come before the commission. And that's that's a problem that we consider. Why don't we discuss each of those two issues separately relative? So one of the issues is that it takes away the reference to probationary employees and applicants in the proposed rule change. Yes, sir. As we discussed when we, we met on this issue. Yes, sir, we did discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's fine. I just no, I understand that. Uh, just to make it clear. Um, it is my opinion, obviously it's going to be up to the rest of the commissioners, it's my opinion that if you take a look at the Constitution, which creates the State Police Commission and the enabling legislation, this commission has no authority for appeals for probationary employees or applicants. That our jurisdiction is limited to uh, classified state police personnel. As a result, if, they, if there's an error in, in Chapter 1, we haven't made the changes to Chapter 1 yet, but we're going to fix that error in Chapter 13. Uh, I'm not aware of any case law on that, dealing with your interpretation of the statute, and that might take some more consideration, is what I'm telling you. I, I, I'm not. I didn't buy into it. I heard what you said and I appreciate what you said, <laughs> but I'm not buying into it. You're taking away applicants that would, the right of applicants, I, I think that's wrong. I mean, you know, if they if they can't go here, it's the first I hear about it. I hadn't seen any cases that say that. So that's that's my problem. But it looks like we're lit. It looks like y'all trying to, if we strike, uh, you know, in, in 13.1, it has certain A through M enumeration of the types of appeals you can file. And, and it looks like the whole theory was to reduce the types of appeal you would file to reduce your, to, to further reduce your jurisdiction or, or to limit your jurisdiction based on the belief that the enabling legislation uh, is what it is. Well, I think we ought to have a court case over that before you reduce it take away people's, like, applicants and probationary employees' rights. Uh, I'm, I don't want to go to some others, for instance. Well, wait, wait, we can't go to another. We need to stick on this issue right here. Let's address the other question that you raised, which is outside of what we were talking about. But that's fine. You want to talk about the fact that we've eliminated paragraphs D through M. As we've indicated, and as the general circular which we issued also indicated, there is no intent to limit the scope of this commission's authority to hear appeals However, it is our opinion that all of the things that were previously uh, enumerated in D through M are contained in the paragraphs A through C, subject to our disagreement over whether or not it applies to probationary and uh, employees and applicants. So there is no limit on our jurisdiction other than to limit it to what we believe is appropriate under the enabling um, constitutional provision and statute that says we have jurisdiction over classified state so let's not mix those out. Well, and this is this is the point I think I tried to make to you on that day, and and we'll make to the rest of the members of the commission for whatever decision they make. But you know, I represent or the State Troopers Association represents uh, I don't know seven eight hundred people who are not lawyers. As far as I know, none of them are lawyers. But in any event, what we had before was a statement in the rules of the types of, 
a demonstrative statement of the types of cases that could be considered by this commission. And what you want to do is, is take away those, uh, and, that enumeration of the types of cases. My concern is that a state policeman who is looking at your rules is going to lose the opportunity of seeing the types of cases this commission can address. The, 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 the Troopers Association has every opportunity to give them a handbook, publications, post it up on the wall someplace. They can know what falls within these three rules. It's, you, could, you could list a million things under this rule that we so choose, but it is more efficient and more effective to allow you as their counsel and the association to pass on what we said in the, in the circular, and that is we're not limiting the areas that are appealable. We, we do have a disagreement over who, which persons can make those appeals, but relative to the elimination of those additional paragraphs, which is a different topic than we started talking about, it does not change the things that are appealable to this commission. And I understand your concern about well, tell that to the guy on the street. Some of the concern that and give him more direction. Some of the concern that Mr. Miet had relative to a rule change, well, relative to the rule as it existed in 16. But there's opportunity for the 700 or so troopers who aren't aren't lawyers to get the advice they need to know what we say in this circular. If I could, too, Mr. Falcon, they can pick up the phone and call us. Since I've been on this commission, this commission was criticized for being at state police headquarters. We moved over here. Our phone lines are separate. Nobody sees a trooper walking in here. They can pick up the phone and call Mr. Hanneman. They can speak to him. What we're trying to do is not limit anyone's rights. What we're trying to do is clean this up. If a trooper has a question, and hypothetically that trooper is not a member of the LSTA and does not have access to you, they certainly have access to a phone or the ability to come over here and sit down and speak to us. Let's not forget our role. Our role is to help them that need to be helped with these kind of issues. It, it, there's no, I don't see a great big hurdle for the average trooper on the street that may not be an attorney and hypothetically is not a member of the LSTA to be able to pick up the phone or come over here and say, I have a problem with this. In the past, we were criticized that those troopers would be recognized coming in and out of our offices because we were at state police headquarters. We're not there anymore. So please, I appreciate the fact that the lawyers need to work out some of the lawyer stuff, but as a commissioner that's not an attorney, I don't see this as limiting the trooper to be able to get the answers that he needs. I see it cleaning up this language. To, to Mr. Simeon's point, we could sit here and list everything under the sun. All it's going to do is make this thing this thick and probably less likely for the average trooper that's not an attorney to want to pick it up and read it. That's just my opinion as, as, as it relates to that specific issue. Under, from my understanding, the appointing authority has the ability to uh, dismiss a promotion, probationary employee. Is that law? And if he has no recourse, where you're saying he should have the recourse to come here, and I agree with him. He could call anybody on the board member who wasn't on the LST as long as they're notified, hey, if you're a probationary employee and the appointing authority decides to let you go for, for causes that you feel is unfair, you either go to an attorney and present your case to the court system, if not here, but you, uh, in my opinion, you still would be able to reach out to us or the board to say, you know what, I'm a probationary employee, I feel I was un was let go unfairly and I want to know my recourse before the board and what are my options and that's understandable so and I don't know if it has to be in there uh, to necessarily know that you have that option and if we're at an impasse whether or not a probationary employee even has the right to come in front of us you know obviously as, as, as commission members or speaking for myself as a commission member I'm going to yield to the two attorneys that are my fellow commissioners and, and and Lenore to tell me that. Short of that, then I think on that one point, we get an AG opinion. Because you have your opinion, I respect your opinion. My cohorts up here have their opinion, I respect their opinions. If we're gonna be at an impasse, let's get an AG opinion. Well, do, do they have the right to appeal or not? 
I understand what you're saying, but I, I mean, short of that, I don't know what else to do about that one question. Open to suggestions. I'm commissioner well, now. One, one thing that I thought about about this specific problem is that we can change our enabling legislation that allows us to cover that. Uh, in other words, by legislatively increasing it to cover uh, to cover discrimination against uh, probationary employees um, there. But it looked like to me that it was pretty clear that it was only covered with classified state police employees. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have that, that right which you're talking about, but, but that, that it needs to be done, I think, legislatively. And that's what I would suggest would be a possible solution to this. I believe it would have to be a, wouldn't it have to be an amendment to the Constitution? Yeah, I mean, could be, could about be. The right, that's, 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 that's the big legislature. Yeah. That's the big, well, yeah. we may be going in that direction anyway right. at some point in time, but anyway. You can only write. Right. Michelle Gerard, I'm an attorney from the Department of Public Safety Office of State Police. I just, I want to point out while we're on the topic, before we get away from Is it on this topic? It is on this topic. Okay. That if you read 13.1a, uh, it says any person in the classified service who's been alleged to have been discriminated against. That means, in my opinion and in my practice, it includes probationary employees. If you look at B, it talks about people who have gained permanent status those are your permanent employees, have the right to uh, appeal a disciplinary action. So I don't read this rule change as taking away a probationary employee's right to allege discrimination to this commission, because it says any person. And I mean, this mirrors, from what I gather, the Civil Service Commission rules, and there are cases that deal with this. So, you know, you don't have a property interest in your job in the Civil Service and the State Police Commission until you obtain permanent status. But this rule, as I read it, retains the right for a person in the classified service, which would include probationary employees, to allege discrimination. That was the only comment I had, if that clarifies it. And that is how it works at civil service as well. That a person who has a probationary employee who has a claim of discrimination does have to wait for the commission to prove discrimination. Only that. So maybe that helps. Just making comments. I'm not, no, I don't get a vote. No, I don't. <laughs> we realize that. But, I, but we would like to address your concerns and your comments. And my, uh, that's a broader read of, of where we would be at the end of the day with this. Uh, the, the proposed rules in, in subsection K strike uh, the right of a trooper to appeal if he's disciplined solely on the grounds that he received an unsatisfactory service grade. To me, that's, again, taking away the right that he previously had to, to challenge and appear before this commission on grounds that, uh, solely on the grounds that he had unsatisfactory <coughs> service rating. Well, I'll let Mr. Hanneman address that issue. Right, I think my notes are that back in my office, <laughs> uh, specifically. But uh, that had been addressed before by this body uh, in a general circular, and when uh, Chapter 10 was reviewed years ago, and that it was determined that it's not in, under the uh, purview of the commission to uh, sort of second guess a, uh, a rating uh, or to do an appeal of a rating. And, um, and furthermore, when the, uh, when the rules were revised, the, the terminology changed. Unsatisfactory is no longer a rating in the chapter 10 of the commission's rules. So uh, again, if there is a violation of a rule, if it was if it was terminated, uh, then you would fall under B or C. So if you look, I guess, yeah, for discipline. Yeah. My, my problem is that if you have an appeal from an unsatisfactory rating, the burden of proof is one thing. If you have an appeal from a disciplinary action, the burden of proof is something else. But it's been established. Just a comment. Uh, section uh, one of what concerns me the, probably the most is the section, the deletion of 13.1L, uh, which 
reads that an applicant for employment in the classified and any employee in the classified service. So this is another one where we're taking away the applicant, you see. And uh, this is a this is a rule that came over from civil service as far as I know. It's a rule that came over from civil service years ago. So uh, apparently applicants had whether it was challenged or not, applicants under the rule had a, a right to um, allege that they've been discriminated against because of the membership or non-membership in a private organization. That's what we are. Any, anything that you want to take away our members' rights to challenge, they are being protected. They can't be discriminated against because they are a member of our organization or the Troopers Coalition or any other private organization. That's protected by the Constitution. If I understood Mr. Simeon's argument was it doesn't need to be in our rules because it's in the Constitution. Well, it relates to this organization, and all we're doing is tracking the language in the court. And again, it, 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 it alerts <coughs> members or it alerts state policemen that this is a right they have. I'm not sure how many of them carry a, po a pocket ca uh, copy of the Constitution in their back pocket when they're out on the road. Uh, but this is a specific provision in, in, the, in, the United, in our Louisiana Constitution, and, and I, I took the argument to be, well, we don't need it in the rules since it's in the Constitution. What's wrong with having it in the rules? What's, what's wrong with uh, making it very obvious to employees that they have this protection? I mean, we discussed that issue previously. We've Addressed it here, unless someone else has another comment. Let me we'll, we'll take your comment. I'm really just not opposed to leaving it in. I mean, I know, I, I, and I understand you want to modify the document, but if it's been in civil service before and it's in this document, and it's not hurting the document, and it's only giving a visual uh, consideration to the troopers when they read that, that they're protected from that since they may not know the Constitution. I, I agree with you. So, and that's, you know, that's my three point. sentences in there, okay, it makes the document a little longer. I mean, it really doesn't matter. So I think leaving it in there is not really a big issue in my estimation. <laughs> Any other comments? Trying to keep track of this. Uh, so we we're looking at 13.1. Any other comments on 13.1? 13. And 13.1, uh, in, going back to my initial thing about probationary employees and, and applicants, if they can't come to this commission to address, to get relief, is there somewhere they can go? Because when I try and go to the courts, the courts are quick to always say, that's a matter for civil service. We're not going to assume jurisdiction for this. It's a subject matter for you. And, and then they, they cite the rule that says, uh, Section 50 of Article 10, which says that the commission has the exclusive power. And then they, they don't let you go to court. So where do you go? Uh, but that's, that's again, my comments about applicants and, and probationary employees. Okay, well, why don't we go back to your comments relative to the change in definition of discrimination. <clears throat> I, I think that got kind of lost as we were discussing the, the, the other issues. So it's your position that there's a change, there's a difference in the definition between discrimination in Chapter 1 and in this proposed rule? I think so. There is. There is a, the the rule thirteen point one a is the verbiage as it is in the Constitution. Uh, chapter one rule of discrimination again was I believe the, the effect of rules being copied over upon the creation of this commission, um, and it has additional verbiage that doesn't that goes beyond what's constitutionally. It goes beyond the, the, the scope of the authority that the Constitution grants to this commission. 
And so that's why we're living. We're going to get to chapter 1 later. We didn't do them starting with 1. We started with, with, okay. with 13. But the reason we limited the definition is because it's consistent with the grant of authority that this commission has given. You know, we can't go outside of the authority that the Constitution gives us. If, and if there's something that this commission does not have jurisdiction over, I think, Mr. Falcon, you could be more than capable of arguing to the court why it is the court should hear the case. All right, but right now, um, why don't we move to the next comment? I, I did want to give you a chance to talk about that because I thought yeah, we sure. could get it discussed sufficiently. Anything after 13.1? Well, I'm not finished with 13. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if you look at 13.1 M, it deals with people who are laid off. Any person in classified service who alleges that he has been subjected <laughs> to a layoff in violation of any provision of Chapter 13, what is wrong with that? Why, why are we taking that out? You don't want to tell people if you've been laid off, you're out of work. It's like the federal government putting all these people on furlough and so forth. You're out of work. There's nothing you can do about it. Can you come to this commission? I, I believe you can. If, you, if, the, if the layoff is conducted improperly, the court's not going to hear that. This commission has to hear that. Would, would that person have been adversely affected by a violation of the provisions of state police commission article or any state police commission rule other than chapter 10? Yes. And if so, he would file his appeal under C. When you're talking and about I'll chapter 10. I don't the rest of the commissioners, but I take I umbrance you, to being compared to the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that I think subsection M deals with chapter 17, not chapter 10. That's my point. So it's a violation of a rule other than a rule of chapter 10. So he could take his appeal. Well, I, I, and that takes us to 13.1c. You you are, you are eliminating in, in C. And this was a little, this is confusing for me. Any person in the classified service who is alleged to have been adversely affected by a violation of any provision of the state police rule or article or the, or the, or the commission rule other than a rule in Chapter 10. Chapter 10 has to do with performance evaluations. So we have no authority over that. Why don't you have authority over that? And, and I'll give you an example. Chapter 10, chapter 10 has <coughs> specifies what's to be included in a uh, in a in performance evaluation, what the components are. So if you violate that rule, an evaluation is done contrary to that rule. I can't come to the commission and complain about it. Is that what you're saying? If, if there's a violation in the way that the performance evaluation is conducted. Then Boy, it's a successful rating. Yeah, but, but that, if you determine that, suppose you don't determine that, I can't come to the committee. You know, it's, that's, it, the rule provides that if there is a, essentially a defect in the way that the evaluation was, con was conducted, uh, the benefit goes to the employee. Uh, the, but who I'll, makes the determination, Jason, if, if there's a rule by the That's the point. They would, the, the employee can pick up the phone or send an email to myself uh, to say there has been I got a needs improvement and I'm or unsuccessful and um, there's an opportunity for for review there. I'll double check that but but, but, it's, but it's a review by the executive director you can't you're trying to deny us to come to the commission and complain. We're not trying to deny you anything and I kind of take offense to that. We're not trying to deny anyone anything. I've told you that. I've said that. What we're trying to do is clean up this document. If there's going to be disagreements between you and the attorney sitting up here over what we have jurisdiction over, my only suggestion to everyone is we get AG opinions. If they're telling me, as a voting commissioner, we don't have authority or jurisdiction over a certain issue, and you're sitting here saying, yes, we do, then I'm not smart enough to figure it out, and I need an AG opinion. 
That's what that's what a lot of these arguments are boiling down to. Take out take the argument of redundancy out of this. You keep saying that we have authority over certain things that Mr. Hanneman and Mr. Simeon are saying we don't. I, I don't know where to go from there. Well, I'm what I'm I'm rule, I'm looking at rules that currently exist that say you do, and you're taking those away. That that bothers me. It, well, we're and not it, taking them away. If they're redundant, and it's 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 specified somewhere else, we're taking the redundancy out of it. We're trying to clean up the documents that we all know. I think can we all agree that this was cut and paste from civil service a long time ago, 1991, perhaps? As everybody in the audience is shaking their head, yes. And we've heard it time and time again. We're trying to clean the documents up. Again, for the record, for the third time, we are not trying to take any troopers' ability to come to this commission away from them. We're trying to clarify the document and clean it up. I believe that, it, as you said there, that is absolutely your true belief. Thank you. I'm concerned about how our court's going to determine it later. Yes. Not that. Well, Jared said on on December on January 10th, 2000, he didn't mean so to take Biden away Trump, anything. If, but if, if it's gone, it's gone. If you believe we have authority over something, and everybody sitting up here, the lawyers sitting up here, and the executive director sitting up here are advising us, commissioners, that we don't have authority over something, short of getting an AG opinion, what do you what do you suggest I do? Short of getting an AG opinion, you're saying one thing. They're saying something else. I'm not trying to limit anybody's anything. Short of getting an AG opinion, what should we do? Tell me. Have a vote. Have a no, vote, vote I, based I, on I, ignorance. Listen, have I agree a, with him. If the lawyers can't come to a conclusion of what the law reads and what's the constitutional rights of this commission versus the laws and constitution of this state, it is not, in my opinion, my profession, I'm not an attorney, it's the attorneys and you to decide. If you come to an impasse and you can't decide what reads what and what's right based on what the troopers should have available to them, then it needs to go somewhere outside this body. Does that, does and then once we get the opinion back, I'm happy to have a vote. And then it but I want to have a vote based on what the law says. <coughs> if y'all are at an impasse at what the law says. <coughs> the, the only uh, logistical problem with taking that approach is we can never change the rules. Uh, that we as a commission have an obligation to one, promulgate, and two, enforce. Uh, we have to run down to the AG's office every time there's a disagreement over, over these issues. Um, so, but Jason, just one more time. Why is it uh, based, the chapter 10 doesn't follow it in the APA? No. We had some history here. Right. Because <laughs> right. it's, it's not a change we're making now. Yes, it, and again, the determination, I don't have the, the, the circular or the transmittal that was issued, but years ago, before the revision of, the, of its current form of Chapter 10, uh, the commission decided that it does not have the, uh, the, the purview to, to second guess a, a supervisory rating that has appeal procedures, because Chapter 10 is essentially a procedure for how an appeal should be conducted. Internally at Internally LSP. at LSP. And that has a process, and a process for the effect of an evaluation, what an evaluation is, how an evaluation is defined. Um, if it's not performed correctly or timely, then you get a, uh, an unrated evaluation, which has the effect of successful, which means uh, that you're satisfactory. And so, part of the issue is this commission doesn't need to have an appeal if someone says, well, I was rated successful, but I think I'm exceptional. The commission can't put, it does not work with the employee on a day-to-day -day basis to say whether or not they're exceptional or successful. The supervisor is the one that. Well, but what the but, commission but, can but, do is the commission, a person can appeal if there was discrimination in the process of their review, or if you know was there was a violation of policy. another rule in the process of their review. Those things allow them to appeal to us rather than second guessing the agency's review of its own employees. I, I don't want to. I'm not a suggestion as we are second guessing of the agency review, but if they do it wrong, they should have a right to bring it to this commission. If, they, if the agency does it wrong, it's not discrimination, they just, for instance, 
it, it's the first rule, 10.1 10. 10. says required components, a three-level evaluation <laughs> system. Suppose they don't have a three-level evaluation system. Who do I complain that to if you're excluding chapter 10? Because Mr. Hanneman would have the authority to say that well, you didn't comply with the rules, is what I heard him say earlier. And therefore, the employee gets the, the better rate, the, the benefit of the, the unrated rating. But suppose the employee doesn't agree with Mr. Hanneman's determination. Who do we complain to? I would say, I would say this. If the department does not follow proper protocol within policy and procedure and is not done properly by that employee, then you should be able to come before the commission. Not the content of what he was rated on or how he was rated. I agree with you. That's the point I'm making. He was rated incorrectly by policy, and he addresses that with his upper rank and management, and they say, no, he should have the ability to come here and say, they did this wrong, and they didn't follow proper protocol to do my evaluation. That's my complaint, not that I got a acceptable or I don't. Yeah, I don't want to come here. I'm certainly... Falcon doesn't want to be here every every third Thursday or fourth Thursday arguing about if somebody got a satisfactory rating who should have gotten wanted an exceptional or, or even got an unsatisfactory rating as opposed to satisfactory. That's not what I want to do. But if if the system gets askew, <coughs> I want to be able to complain to somebody. And if Mr. Hanneman, if it falls on Mr. Hanneman's deaf ears, I want to be able to go. I mean, I, I gotta believe if, I, if, I, if we bring some evidence to Jason. I mean, I, I, I feel very confident that Jason Hanneman is going to do the right thing. I don't know who's going to be sitting in that seat, a seat next month. But Mr. Batman, we've we've got the point now. You you, we are not voting on this just yet, but we understand, and obviously we're going to have at least one, a motion from one of the commissioners to strike the language other than a rule in Chapter 10 when we get to voting on this. We un we all understand the issue now. So and I would just comment on I, I have numerous years with State Civil Service. I have numerous years as an HR director, and numerous years of, uh, conducting evaluations under rules that are identical to this because these rules that were adopted in Chapter 10 were ones that were adopted years ago, but to align the entire agency under the same framework of performance evaluation. So when civil service changed the performance evaluation system, this agency adopted that to make it easy and more uniform for the administration of the performance evaluation system. So in doing so, it was determined that, that set up a, a proper framework. Now there can be some review, and there, but, but the ability to appeal a, a specific nuanced rating, if the employee can show and demonstrate that there was a, a flaw in the process, you know, the performance evaluation uh, was not timely, then by default they get an unrated, which is equivalent to a satisfactory rating. The end, because you're satisfactory, there's no other issue involved. There's no other problem for, with regards to the performance. I understand if the employee wins, but as opposed to the employee doesn't win, who does he complain to? That's the point. So, right, so all right, I, I understand you want me to move along, and I'm happy to move along. Well, I, I just, I mean, I but, think the point is understood at this point. So the question is whether we will keep the language other than a rule in Chapter 10. If we vote to keep it, then it raises the concerns that you raise. If we vote to eliminate it, then that concern is taken care of. Uh, my biggest, my biggest uh, concerns are in the sections, let's see, uh, 13, 5, Summary Disposition of Appeal. And we, we talked about this. I believe this needs some further discussion, some further revision, and some further consideration. And I, I want to point this out. Was it at third? 
The only documents a commission will consider in support of or opposition of a request for summary judgment are the letter of discipline, the appeal, certified medical records, written stipulations, recorded statements by appellants, transcripts of report, reported statements by appellants, and other evidence that the commission deems reliable. <coughs> Who has the recorded statements of the appellant? Who has the transcribed statements? It's not going to be the appellant. He's not going to have that. The recorded statements of the appellant in the hands of the Internal Affairs Section of State Police. They have them. Consul doesn't get to participate and ask questions in those recorded statements. So if we, if we accept recorded statements taken by IA and that's submitted to you in support of a motion for summary judgment, that's one side of the story. That was done without the opportunity to uh, ask the employee uh, who, who was statement was being recorded questions by his representative. The transcript of the recorded statement is the same thing. Where is the countervailing affidavits, the right to submit affidavits? It seems to me that affidavits are, you know, and I, I realize that y'all say this is not, doesn't follow uh, the summary judgment rules of civil, in the civil courts, but what do we put in? We're not going to have any recorded statements that are recorded to put forth the points of view of the employee. We only going to have the, the IA recorded statements. The only going to be the only statement that only records answers to the questions that were asked by IA. Just one second. <laughs> about these recorded statements. They're one-sided recorded statements. But the, the, the employee can submit an affidavit that contradicts the one-sided recorded statement or that adds sub additional substance of content or circumstance to the recorded statement. Mr. Simeon, I'm concerned about getting the recorded statement, you see. A, a motion for summary judgment is filed and we have 15, we get a recorded statement for the first time and we got 15 days to respond. When these recorded statements are taken, the way the IA works here, they, the, the case might, they might have had four months to develop their case. I'm gonna get a recorded statement and I got 15 days to put together the case in opposition to that recorded statement. That's my concern. Sure, I could, I could put in uh, an affidavit by the employee saying, I, I, dis I disagree, I don't disagree with this and so forth. I'm concerned that I, I, I would have to have time to, to develop not only affidavit from maybe the employee, but affidavit from other people. Well, until I see the recorded statement, I often don't go to the record, I don't participate in the recorded statements. Most troopers, they get called at eight, I hey, they go over there and give a statement. That's what happens. I mean, so you I tell you, I've probably the been. Your concern is the timeline? I'm trying to understand what your concern is. Your concern I'm, concerned, is the, I'm concerned with the timeline. All, I'm concerned with the, the, the affidavits being included, obviously. And it was my recollection, just as yours, Eulis, that, that 
We did say we were going to have affidavits. Yeah, we got over that. That's, that's, just, that's a hurdle. We're over that one. Let's that, go that on the next one. The, the, the next hurdle that you're talking about is the I appreciate days. you want to go through. Uh, this, this is, I I'm think, trying to critical. What your concern this is. This is, this is, this is well, the way summer judgment would be handled, be critical to the benefit of these troopers. I, I am concerned that I wouldn't have enough time to, to so what put together a time put, be for you. Uh, you're saying you don't like the 15 days. I respect that. I'm asking you what, what timeline, and I think the other commissioners would like to know 15 days isn't enough. What is enough? I don't do what you do, so I need to understand. I, I would say maybe 45 days from the time that we got served with the summary disposition. It, it got served with, I, I'm presuming that I would get served with the summary disposition and attached to it would be the, mo the, the, the transcript. That's going to be the first time I see the transcript. Wait, I, don't, I don't know what investigation can be taken. Okay, so other than the affidavit and other than uh, maybe 45 days, any other issue with, with this procedure? It sounds like you've got some sympathetic ears to those issues. Uh, and obviously the affidavit, we're just going to fix. That was an oversight. The, the timeline, you got some sympathetic ears to that issue, so we tried to figure out the right way. Well, I, I, I think if you, if you gave somebody 45, I'm not going to be here much longer, you know. I'm, I'm not going to be here <laughs> all of 2019, probably, so I'm uh, worried I'll, about I'll who else is going to be doing this. I hope you just mean in your current capacity. <laughs> in my current capacity. <laughs> in my current capacity. Uh, Michelle, did you want to comment on I did. That Michelle, issue. Michelle Gerard again. Um, when we spoke, I, and I understand what Mr. Falcon is saying about the affidavits, but I think we specifically included at the end and other evidence that the commission deems reliable, which leaves That's it right. wide open, not just limited to affidavits. Well, the commission finds the evidence is reliable and can be admitted. But we want specifically affidavits. Yeah, I mean, that, we, that, and we talked about that. I thought it was included. I, 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 and I agree with you. I think it was on site. But, but. I, I just want to remind the commissioners that in Chapter we have protections for troopers who are under investigation, and I think the rules in Chapter 12 cover some of these issues that talks about when a trooper can get a copy of his own statement and that they have the right to have counsel present during uh, the questioning. They can't interrupt the questioning, but I think they do have the right at the end of the questioning to add anything else that they would like to add. So there are some other protections in the State Police Commission rules that would deal with this. I mean or allow them to use things in a summary disposition. And just because a summary disposition gets filed doesn't mean that it would be granted. So, And we are talking about the statement of the trooper himself. So you would think they know what they said. But do you have any issue relative to the proposal of 45 days as opposed to 15 days? None whatsoever. Okay. All right. Sounds like you have a lot of sympathetic ears on that okay. issue. On, uh, Oh, so so would would at the time I was I was a little concerned also, and, and, and this may be sort of silly when you understand the concept of social summary disposition. But uh, when you say other evidence that the commission deems reliable, it's not going to be any verbal testimony at a hearing on a summary disposition. I take it. I mean, I, I thought that goes without saying, but I. When we have in here other evidence, I wouldn't want to come to the hearing and all of a sudden we got some witnesses because that's what becomes a trial. The procedure does not contemplate lies. Okay. You, you know, I'll go back to the fact that we're saying we're not following the, 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 the rules of the summary, summary judgment. So that, that was the reason for that comment. Uh, the other, one other thing, I, I, I'm presuming that if. Uh, that all of the evidence that was being offered in support of the motion for summary disposition would be submitted at the time the summary disposition was submitted, as opposed to you file a motion for summary disposition and then at the hearing you present the evidence. Yeah, I mean, that, we'll address that when we address If we address, if we address, in other words, I just want to, I want to get it, I want to get everything and have an opportunity to respond to it 45 days would be great. Uh, but I need to get it all at the front end, not at the time of the hearing. It, it goes back to not having the right of discovery, the right to, to require production of documents. I understand, Michelle made a good point. We can get a statement 
we can get us if they take ten statements, one of them the, turns out to be the statement of the appellate. We can get that statement, but we can't get all those other statements before the motion for summary disposition. So we only know part of what they have. Well, but the only thing that would be admissible is before the statement of the appellate. So. All right. <clears throat> Oh, and this was just, this was another uh, thing, <laughs> sort of, if I was going to be here much longer, that would be a big concern to me. Uh, it has to do with, with continuations of appeals. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, no. 13, it's 13 9. I would like to see that the attorney for the appellant would be guaranteed a continuance of a trial or either a motion for summary disposition if they had a prior conflicting court appearance. I operate a one-man deal and, and every day almost I go to court somewhere. Almost every day. And if it works great here because I know a year in advance when you're going to have your most of you, you know, when you can have your hearing and so forth. But sometimes I can't control that. In February, I'm going to be over in federal court. They don't ask me if I have a state police commission meeting when when they set a trial. Uh, so I would like to have y'all consider including as a mandatory grounds for a, con a continuance if the attorney of record has and can supply evidence that he has a prior conflict in court date, that that would be <coughs> uh, grounds for an appeal. I mean, grounds for a continuance. Well, you know, we discussed this. And I understand, you, want, did, you, you need to make a public record. I'm, I'm not being critical of that, but... We did discuss. I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize. No, no. We spent a good bit of time discussing no, no, all these no, things, no, no. but and, and other the, people weren't here. And no, no, and I don't mean by that that you shouldn't make these comments again. That was not my point at all. I, uh, I'm just prefacing what I was about to say because I'm about to repeat what I said before, and that, that's all I meant by that. But no, you certainly have every right to bring it up again uh, so that everyone else can hear your, your thoughts on it, and it, it should be part of this public hearing. Um, but. As I indicated, automatic rules on things like a continuance, I just don't think are appropriate. Uh, I've never seen this commission deny someone a, uh, a request for a continuance if they have a legitimate reason, including having to be in another court. I'm particularly sensitive to, sensitive to that issue, okay, because uh, I know how that can be. Uh, but I just don't think it needs to be an automatic rule. I don't think you'll, you'll have an issue with... Uh, either the, uh, the director or this commission granting you a continuance if you have a, a conflict that was set before the time that we set our... And, and as I told you then, and I'm, I'm just raising the issue, but as I told you then, never happened to me before. I always got a, a fair, what I consider fair consideration, uh, but like I may not be here, you know, somebody else may be having this battle to fight. Okay. Uh, and I think if I could go to uh, 1317, page 19. I, I, I'm not sure how y'all how y'all plan this to work. You, you determine that somebody gave. Well, if they refuse to testify here, here on the subpoena and they refuse to testify and they're classified state employee, you, you would want to hold them in contempt. How are you going to do that? Are you going to have hold them in contempt at that hearing? Uh, what I think in civil court they call it a direct contempt because the judge observed what happened. Or do you have to have a hearing to determine if they were in contempt? where they have some rights. I don't, I don't know how contempt is going to work with this body. I don't understand how y'all propose to deal with contempt. For instance, you, 
it goes on to say if somebody gives gives a false answer, well, who's going to determine it was false? Do we have a separate hearing? Or does he then get charged with by this commission? Gets charged with giving a false statement at a hearing, and then they have a hearing to determine if it was a false statement and if he should be held in contempt. How do we do that? I don't understand those answers. I don't understand how the process is going to work in accordance with 1317. Okay. I'll just say, go ahead. It's in Rule 2.12. There's a procedure for punishing for contempt, and it's when the contempt has happened before the commission and when it's happened outside. There's A and B. It's poorly written. It's another thing. Well, which we may have to rewrite. Yeah, but, but, well, but my, my point is this. I, I don't know if it absolutely doesn't it going to apply to me, but uh, I think this, how y'all do that, I, I always was concerned about how y'all gonna enforce contempt, particularly if it's somebody outside of the, somebody that's not a classified employee. I don't know how that would work. I've heard a lot of things. We're gonna go to court to do that. I've heard that say that in state civil service. I never saw anybody do it before. But we do have a current rule in chapter two that deals right. with and, and like civil service, you're right. It's never happened. And, and it's a rule that's out there that's not, ha we've not had to use. But currently, there is, a, there is a procedure in place on how so what, what is that procedure? Because I, I never paid attention to it. Do we have a trial? He says they can be punished uh, forthwith and without a, it should be trial instead of trail. Um, and, um, other than affording him an opportunity to be heard orally by way of defense or mitigation, so the person can respond orally before the commission or a referee. So let me just ask you a question. Uh, Jay O'Quinn is a defendant, uh, excuse me, is the appellant in an appeal before you And somebody that we call as a witness testifies false, well, refuses to testify. As part of his hearing, that guy is sent to, sentenced to contempt? Or do we have a separate proceeding against that individual? That's the point I'm trying to make. Because I'll obviously be representing that individual here. That's what concerns me. This just says person. But, but, but more so, refusal to respond is, I mean, that, that's more, much more clear. But somebody thinks somebody gave some false testimony. What are we going to do about that? How is it going to be handled? Does it, I, maybe, maybe this rule applies to that. I just never read, never, I don't know if I've ever read this. I think, I think what happens as a matter of practicality in civil service and in state police is when a person is, uh, when the commission believes a person is not telling the truth, the commission considers that person to be untruthful and weighs that in the evidence when they're making a determination of the appeal, generally. Um, that's what's happened in, in the history of the commission. Could you say it again, Lenore, because I didn't understand. When the commission, in, in my experience, when the commission, and even in civil service, when they believe that someone's not, a witness is not necessarily being truthful, that goes to the weight of the evidence in the case. Mm -hmm. And they, and, and it has happened. In, in recent past, that even in decisions, the commission has stated that they did not believe a particular witness to be truthful. Which I understand it goes to the consideration of that appeal that's then before right. the commission. I'm worried about in the aftermath, the person who's accused of giving, uh, accused of giving false testimony, what rights will he have? Will, it, will that go through the investigation stage? Is that gonna be a chapter 17 type investigation? and you have a hearing as a result of that. I don't understand what is proposed. That's there, my problem. There's not a procedure for after someone's been held in contempt. I mean, it's not this. You, you know, you, so, these rules put in some pretty, you can't work for the state for 10 years. Well, I would just assume they would lose their credibility and the department of the commission officer would take action against that particular commission officer and bring it before investigation that they decided. Suppose it's one of their witnesses that, that gave the false statement. It's, it's the state's witness that gave the false statement. <laughs> you think that these the appointing authorities will take the action? 
Well, I think it's got to be the commission okay, to take the action. But right now, we're dealing with the substantive <coughs> issue in this rule. We will be addressing rule uh, chapter two. And at that point, if we need to deal with the procedural aspect of how we make these determinations, we'll be able to address that when we get to chapter two. Uh, this is not a change in the rule that anyone had any complaints about. We simply reworded it uh, to limit it to state police uh, in the classified state police service because we thought it was overly broad to the extent that it applied to persons outside of that service. But when we get to chapter two and we have to put together some procedural rules on how we get to make these determinations, we have to do that in chapter two. We can't do that in this chapter. Is that would be my position on that. The, the only comment that I wanted to add to the discussion was we have had a case before this commission before where a classified employee did make false statements and we turned around and took additional disciplinary action that resulted in termination. And the commission was able to hear that. Of course. Yeah, and that would be a discipline. And I agree. I, but, but as I, I'm restating myself, but uh, I was interested in the flip side of that was when one of their witnesses gave false statements, they don't necessarily agree with false and they don't do, do anything about it. Then how does it get before well, the Well, it seems to me that you could then file a complaint for an investigation of who would file it, though? Any person under the, under the investigation chapter. A commission. You could ask Mr. Mia to file it, you know, for example. <laughs> Or, or the trooper who yeah, the trooper. Yeah. Yeah. to file it. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's the procedural rules right. that we got to get to when we get to that chapter. We can't, right now we're talking about the substantive issue of, of what our power would be without defining how we, how we exercise that power yet. Mm -hmm. uh, that concludes the comments that I have. Anyone else, any comments on uh, the proposed changes to chapter 13? Um, I made a list of the ones that we may need to deal with in just a second. Just one second. Yeah, and then go back to it. Okay, based on the comments that we've received thus far, um, I don't think I can make a motion, but I would I would entertain a, a motion if one were made to adopt the, the changes to Chapter 13 as promulgated in um, Circular 195 with the exception of that we will come back and vote individually on whether or not we want to include 13.1L that Commissioner Foss indicated he may uh, have some support for. Uh, and also on with the, with the understanding that we would revisit the issue of 13.1c relative to whether we would drop the language that says other than rule a rule in chapter 10 um, and also with the proviso that we will need to add uh, to chapter to rule 13.6 a provision that sets forth that all of the evidence in support of a motion for summary disposition must be filed and served on the opposing party at least 45 days prior to the hearing. 
So moved. Oh, oh okay. we use it to include that. We would include the word affidavit, but I mean, we'll vote on that separately. But yes, we would include that. So does that cover the concerns that everyone has? All right. So do we have a motion? We do. I move. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Or do we need to take a roll call vote? Let's let's take a roll call. Right, so I'm speaking to council. Is there any? They so, said they vote on. So you, you're voting to adopt the amendment to the proposed rule right now, with with the exceptions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah. With the exception of those things that are okay. listed, and we'll come back and individually okay. vote on those things. All right. Jerry Ricky. Yes. Elsie Cantrell. Yes. Jeffrey Falls? Yes. Leonard Knapp? Yes. Hill Parit? Yes. All right. Now, now we need to discuss the issues related to, I guess we'll take them. Okay. So you have protocols to ask for public comment on the newly amended proposed rule, and then you vote to adopt the final version, or do you want to delay that until you discuss the exception? You're talking about on the things we're about to talk about changes to? Yeah. Let's put out what the, let's see whether there's a motion okay. to change it before we, right? Okay. Correct. So we okay. can talk to chapter 13 and you're coming back to look at these, okay. these issues. Okay. Those particular okay. issues. So chapter 13 is adopted and now you're looking at the particular areas. It, it was adopted with the understanding that we would come back and look at these particular okay. issues. And I think the first one we ought to take to keep it in, in Chronological order, I'm not talking chronological, but in the order of the rule would be 13.1c, whether we should drop the language that is proposed for 13.1c uh, that says other than a rule in chapter 10. So is, and we've already had public comment on it, but is there any other comment on whether we should drop that language in uh, rule C? A motion to what was the particular the, the the language that is currently in the adopted rule 13.1 C includes language that says other than a rule in chapter 10 which means that there would no there would be no appeal right for a claim violation of a rule in chapter 10 unless the person could claim there was a violation of some other rule there would be certain rights in Chapter 10, certain administrative rights in Chapter 10 that are covered by that chapter, but there would be no appeal. The only right. amendment I would have to talk about Chapter 10 was Paragraph L to keep that in the document. We'll, so that we, we will get to that. We will get to that next. Okay. We'll see. All right. Stay with us. I would move that we just leave it as it is, since it was excluded in the first motion, as I appreciate it, that we adopted all of Chapter 13 except those. I would move that we adopt it as originally proposed. And as with that inclusion, other than a chapter 10, other than a rule in chapter 10, including that in the language so that it's clear that we're, that, that is continued, that, that the whole of C as proposed is included in what we just adopted or are going to adopt. So your motion would be to uh, adopt the change to uh, 13.1c as promulgated in circuit 195. That's correct. I just want to make the record as clear as possible. I second that motion. Okay. Roll call. Yes, sir. Jerry Vicky? Yes. Nelson Cantrell? Yes. Jeffrey Foss? Yes. Leonard Knapp? Yes. Carol Perry? Yes. The ayes have it. Now we'll move to 13.1L. Uh, there was a request during public comment that we leave 13.1L in, which would now become 13.1D. I would make a proposal to uh, just leave it in there, I think, from a vision visionary standpoint so the troopers can see that we may not review the Constitution, though they have that ability. 
and I don't think it's hurt anything by me. So I'll make a proposal to be that chapter from L, which will be D now. Is there a second to the motion? It was moved and seconded. Any public, additional public comment relative to L? My only concern is you could say that about each and every one of the ones that we've eliminated. Uh, that it's visually, that it's given something to look at. But you know, that, that's my only comment relative to that. So would it be appropriate to entertain the motion now? So have you, are you going to vote on this L first? We're going to vote on whether or not to include L as D. L as, would it be D or would you leave all the rest of them vacant and make it oh. L again? Yeah. Well, traditionally, we, we post those that have been um, just for record keeping purposes. Okay. Um, we, would just, we would just retain L. L. Okay, so you would you would show the others as, as it's just redacted and retain this as L. So. It would go from A, B, and C as we come back later and clean up again. But for right now, it would be A, B, and C as we've already passed. Yes. Would show D through K redacted, then it would show L, and it would show M redacted. Or, or repeal. Repeal, yes, I'm sorry, thank you. If that would be the motion that is currently pending. Okay, roll call. Yes. All in favor, let's see. Um, Jerry McKee? Yes. Nelson Kintrell? Yes. Jeffrey Foss? Yes. Leonard Knapp? No. Gail Parit? Yes. Jackson? 13.6 will be a little more difficult um, because we're going to have to write some, some language that would basically get us uh, what we're trying to accomplish, but as I understood the, the public comments and the discussion among the commission during those comments, is there sympathy to, um, uh, well one, let's, let's, what I'd entertain a motion is to add the word affidavits to- It's 13.5, Mr. Chairman, you said 13.6. Oh, okay. My apologies. 13.5 G. Uh, my apologies. I, Wrote six, and that's why I'm saying it. But 13.5. First, we'd entertain a motion to add the word affidavits to the list of uh, evidence that will be considered. And just to make it clear, to also add the word documentary before where it says other evidence that the commission deems reliable. Just to make it clear that we're not talking about live testimony. Okay. Great. Um, okay, second. Any additional public comment on the proposed change to 13.5G? Uh, you want, I need to read it? Yeah, we're going to need yeah. to read it as, okay. Yeah. Okay. as amended. As amended, 13.5G would read as follows, and it's subject to some additional amendments relative to the time periods, and, and we'll get to in a second. The only documents the commission shall consider in support of or in opposition to a request for summary disposition or the letter of discipline, the appeal by the classified employee, certified medical records, written stipulations, recorded statements by the appellant, transcribed statements by the appellants, affidavits, and other documentary evidence that the commission deems reliable. Any public comment on that proposed change? Yes, ma'am. Technical yes. thing. Yes. By appellants versus of appellants, because when it says transcribed by appellants, oh, it should be of appellants. So, of appellants. Just change the so do I need to reread it? Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, we will change. Any other technical changes? Want to read it again? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna have to tell you, like I told Floyd, we talked about this already. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we missed that when one. When you read it, I heard it, and it made me think I, I, the appellant's not gonna transcribe it. I understand. Mm -hmm. The only documents, to, this is the proposed change from what was promulgated in Circular 195. The only documents the commission shall consider in support of or in opposition to a request for summary disposition or the letter of discipline, the appeal by the classified employee, certified medical records, written stipulations, recorded statements of appellants, transcribed statements by appell of appellants, 
affidavits and other documentary evidence that the commission deems reliable. Anything else? We, we would need a motion. I don't move. Did we have a motion already? I think we already have a motion. We have a motion already. Okay. Just a motion. Okay, so. I don't know. You might want to since it's been changed three times. We didn't have the last okay, so. motion. Second. <laughs> <laughs> right. So moved. Seconded. Okay. Uh, roll call. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Chair uh, Riki? Yes. Nelson Cantrell? Yes. Jeffrey Foss? Yes. Larry Knapp? Yes. Carol Bree? Yes. Have it now. Then no. comment. Re no, we still have 45 minutes. Yeah, we still have right. Relative to uh, the comments that were made uh, on the time period of for service of evidence in support of a, a motion for a summary disposition, I would uh, suggest that we entertain a motion to defer that to give us an opportunity to simply write that rule because I don't know that we. Yeah, it's, uh, look at B2. We might B2. be able to just. Where is B2? 18.5 uh, B2, page 7. Page 7. Yeah, it says B2. 15 calendar days, change it to 45. That's what I was thinking. Oh, wanted. okay. I, I, just one second. Let me look at it real quick. I mean, that would that, so that makes it broader in general, even if there isn't an issue of a transcribed statement or something. But it, it still time. gives the commission or referee the right to set a different date for the filing of an opposition, which may happen in the case of a, of a matter where there aren't transcribed statements, where you can shorten it. Okay. We would all, yeah, we'd also, in addition to adding, changing that to 45, we probably need to say uh, we'd have to add some language that requires that all of the evidence be filed. At the t it's from the filing of all of the evidence that's oh, being okay. used in support. Because it doesn't really specifically say that. Right, right. It just says from the filing of the, 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 uh, the motion. But I mean, we probably need two minutes to get to figure it out. Yeah, you want to. Can we take a quick break and y'all can figure it out during the two minutes? And yeah, let's take a quick break. break. So, and that'd be awesome. Yeah. about making some changes to uh, the rule to deal with the issue that was raised in the public comment about the the time period of only being 15 days. In order to accomplish that, what we would need to do would be to address that in Rule 13.5, paragraphs B1 and paragraphs B2. I will read um, what I propose uh, the change to be as a motion, uh, if we have a motion for that. What I would propose we do is we change paragraph B1 to read as follows. Uh, every written request for summary disposition, including all supporting evidence, shall contain a certificate signed by the person filing it, which shall state that the request has been served on adverse on the adverse party in a manner which would reasonably provide notice to the adverse party on the same date as the request is to be received by the commission. The certificate shall state the date and method by which the request was filed and the service was made. That would be the proposed change to the current Rule 13.5B1. Do we have a motion for that change? So moved. Second. Any additional public comment on that? Any comment or questions from the commission? Can we vote on it now? to change that to 45 days and after we have the motion I will read exactly how it would uh, read as changed. I'll move second. Okay. The new paragraph 13.5 B2 would read as follows. The adverse party shall have 45 calendar days 
after such service to file with the executive director in opposition, which may be supported by legal arguments and admissible evidence. The commission or referee may set a different time. I'm sorry, thank you. The commission or referee may set a different date for the filing of an opposition. Any opposition shall be subject to the certificate and service requirement requirements of 13.5B1. Any public comment on the proposed change? All in favor? Take a vote, I guess. Jared Rickey? Yes. Nelson Cantrell? Yes. Jeffrey Falls? Yes. Leonard Neff? Yes. Carol Bree? Yes. No, it's All right. Now, um, I understand there was one uh, comment that uh, we got sidetracked on that we didn't get yeah, for sure. the commission. It, it's my omission. I, I, my scribblings. I <coughs> left out a comment I had about uh, on page 13, uh, rule 1311L, and it states the commission. All the referee may receive stipulated and undisputed facts. Clearly, we are in agreement with that. But it goes on to say uh, the commission or referee may also state for the record facts which the commission or referee, referee find to be undisputed and subject to the appropriate review. Those facts will be deemed as proven. I don't understand how that's going to work. Uh, we're going to start a hearing and the commission is going to just start dictating that we believe A, B, C, D, and E are already proved and we don't have to have any evidence on that? Well, it, what it says is that uh, we would find that they're undisputed. Uh, you know, proved is the right word, but yes. Uh, and you would also be given the opportunity to, if you object to that conclusion, to proper the evidence. My, my point, you know, a lot of, one of the things is deal, when you deal with written stipulations, I find it's, it's, you end up having to tell a story. Part of, part of the presentation of the case is you're telling the story. And if we have undisputed facts that come up during the term, uh, uh, things that you determine are undisputed that are, in fact, continue to be disputed, we're going to be in and out of a hearing, the ref the, uh, the commission is going to leave the room and we're going to put on evidence. I, I just don't understand how it's going to work, how y'all envision, maybe if I understood how y'all envision that's going to work, I could better understand it. But it doesn't make sense to me like it is. The stipulations are an agreement of facts by the parties involved. There's no question. I understand about the stipulation. I'm worried about the ones where the commission says, we are dirt. We are determining these facts are uncontested. For example, there's no no, no dispute. Both parties might not agree with what they determine. Yeah. <laughs> you have to me that the commission is making a finding of fact based on a stipulation, which is an agreement. I, I think that it goes further than that. I think it. I think it. <laughs> the first section talks about undisputed facts, and we. we I, I absolutely agree with. If we have undisputed facts that are stipulated, yeah. certainly I want to use that as much as we can. Well, let, but let, it's when, let, when, when I get some jammed down my throat that I think are, are contested and somebody's going to say, no, these are not contested and we're not going to hear anything, we're going to leave the room. There, that there interrupts the example. presentation of the whole case. There could be an example where you have witnesses produce evidence or testimony in whatever form that the commission then believes to be an undisputed based on the evidence presented. And someone attempts to introduce additional evidence further trying to prove a point that's already been, to the, in the commission's mind, proven, then the commission can say, no, we don't need additional testimony of, of three more witnesses to say this. This is proven um, according to our standards of what is proof. So that would be an example where you could stop a long line of witnesses if you believe a fact is already in evidence. I don't see any, I don't see a commission uh, sitting and saying, you've got some legitimate dispute about a fact, but we're not going to hear it yet. We're not right. going to hear it. It's going to be 
more just from a procedural standpoint. Like I, I agree. I can't that. imagine it coming up. I, can, I can't imagine a scenario other I, I agree with Lenore says if you have something in it. But from the standpoint of the appellate, I'm not sure that the appellate, if it's, if it's clear, why continue to beat, beat the dead horse? But, but if you no, have no, something there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, the one point that I have that, that, I, that I think kind of interrupts, the, 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 I agree with you on it, kind of interrupts the flow is that all of the commission members shall exit the hearing room for the duration of the proffer. Well, uh, normally the proffer I've done it has been done to the court reporter in a trial and uh, uh, I, I've had the judge leave and everything but you don't do it until after after all the testimony and everything in the case has been heard uh, generally. I think the reason we've done it that way is in the case of electronic equipment and something's up and you know they're trying to show one scene of an accident and instead of putting all that back up again or finding that point They've allowed it to happen and just take a brief break. That's that's what I've seen happen here. Right. The contemplation is it would be at the end, but there might be logistical reasons why sometimes you want to do it in the middle of it. Right. But well, we're why, why would you have to move? Why would we have to leave? So that just like with the judge, does, so that you can't say that the, just in here. the additional evidence affected your deliberation. If, yeah. if we determine it's not needed. But, but, yeah, Ms. Falcon. You know, let me, let me say, as a practical matter, in uh, 48 years, I guess it is, 47 years, I, I would normally get to the point when the judge tells me, I already got that, move on. It solves the problem. <laughs> it solves the problem. Uh, it, it's just, uh, otherwise you then argue, you, you know, you attacking the judge. So I, I, I don't see the need for this. It's I the think for not having, you know, a bunch more witnesses come up and that's how I've seen Well, I mean, at this point, I, I don't think, as, as you know from your years experience, this is not going to be a, a real issue. It's just there to allow us procedurally in the right situation, which is going to be very limited, other than the kind of situation Lenore described, to be able to say, okay, we don't need no more of that. We got it. You know, I remember when the, when, when the chairman, a lot of times in the past, when the chairman wasn't a lawyer, though, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm just, look, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't want to sound like I'm being obstructionist or, or trying to complain about things. I'm trying to, I thought my, my role was to just bring up points for consider for your consideration. That's this doesn't seem seems awkward to me doing this. I'm not saying it can't work. Or I'm not saying that that uh, experienced people when they get the clue we've heard enough of that that they're not gonna move on. <laughs> but I've had to be told twice by a judge before, but not, not three times. <laughs> But then, and, uh, Ms. Falcon, we take your comments in the heart in which they were given. Uh, we, and uh, they're appreciated. But do we have a motion to uh, make any amendments or changes to third? Get my number here. 1311 now. Yeah, it was, 13. Already, it was already approved. It was already approved, but so, yeah. I'm seeing whether or not anyone wants to okay. reconsider the, the approval. Don't hear any motion, so we appreciate the comments of this Friday. We second everything in public comment. What's that? One last round of public comment for all the changes that we made. As amended. As amended. Okay. Any additional public comments uh, as amended? Hearing none. Right. No. Final vote on all the amendments. Okay. And now we entertain a motion to. Um, Adopt all of the amendments that uh, to chapter 13 as discussed. Move. Second. And roll call. Um, yes. Sure. Jerry Ricky. Yes. Nelson Cantrell. Yes. Jeffrey Foss. Yes. Leonard Knapp. Yes. Mayor 
Jeffrey. Yes. All right. So the next item on the agenda is uh, the proposed changes to Chapter 16 as promulgated by Circular 195. Uh, any public comments? Mr. Miette, you previously had some. I think we may have addressed those. Yes, sir. You, I think you did. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Falcon, any comments on 16? No, sir. That, that we, we took out the provision and the state police does the investigation. That was the one that had. Yeah, we took that. We took, <laughs> that was as we as we admitted mea culpa. Um, that was taken out. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone? A motion to adopt the changes as promulgated in Circle One Ninety Five to Chapter Sixteen. I'll move. Second. Roll call. Jerry. Yes. Nelson Cantrell. Yes. Yes. Leonard Knapp? Yes. Bill Free? Yes. That's it. Okay. All right. Next item on the agenda is uh, director's report. I will be short. Yeah. It's not too lengthy. Um, again, in your binders, as, as always, you have a copy of the monthly expenditures for the commission. And Next, I want to just mention that a new for 2019, uh, we at the commission have launched a new electronic cadet application. Uh, applicants can now type and save their application. <laughs> and we will allow them to submit it electronically. So 2019, it's a magical year. Uh, we have already seen numerous applicants uh, and applications arrive via email using the new format and very pleased with the progress that we've had so far. And then um, one last item is that the revised testing materials, we're working with the SMEs and our test administrator uh, to have the exam announcement go out by the end of the month. Uh, there, again, will not be a mandatory retest for 2019. Scores will remain valid from the 2018 exam. However, should an employee take the 2019 exam, that grade will be the certifiable score for the applicant until the next cycle. That's the only item I have for Um, the next item on the agenda is item number eight, is opportunity to address the commission by employees or others on matters not on the agenda. We had a request from Mr. Miette to do so and uh, recognize uh, Leon Miette at this time. Leon B. Miette, 114 Magnolia Street, Lake Arthur, Louisiana. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to file a formal complaint for an investigation with the commission. Uh, I have a letter dated January the 9th to Mr. Hanneman. Uh, Dear Mr. Hanneman, please accept this correspondence as a formal request pursuant to State Police Commission Rule Chapter 16, Investigations. I am requesting the State Police Commission to investigate allegations of violations of law, State Police Commission rules, and the Louisiana Constitution by classified members of the Office of State Police acting in their capacity as elected officers of Louisiana State Troopers Association, LSTA, on behalf of the Louisiana Trooper Charities. Specifically, I allege violation of the Louisiana State Constitution, Article 10, Section 47A, and State Police Commission Rule 14-2A-1, 14-2A-4, 14-2A-8, obtained by public records maintained by the Louisiana Ethics Commission Program Computerized Data Management System. Apparently, a check in the amount of $800 was paid by Louisiana Troop for Charities to Acadia Strong Pack on December the 12th, 2018, as stated on the committee's report filed on January the 8th, 2019. Article 10, Section 47A provides that no member of the Commission or State Police Officer in the Classified Civil Service participate or engage in political activity, make or solicit contributions for any political activity make or solicit contributions for any political party, faction, or candidate, except to exercise his right as a citizen to express his opinion privately and to cast his vote, cast his vote as he desires. State Police Commission Rule 14.2A1 provides that no member of State Police Commission and no classified member of State Police Service shall participate or engage 
in political activity, including but not limited to any effort to support or oppose election of a candidate for political officer or support or oppose a particular political party in an election. Members of the commission are expressly prohibited from making a soliciting contributions for any political purpose, party faction, or candidates, State Police Commission Rule 14-2A-4. Members of the commission are expressly prohibited from participating in politi political activities directly or indirectly by paying or promising to pay an, ex an assessment, subscription, or contribution for any, any political party, faction, or candidate. State Police Rule 14-2A-8. General, general Circular Number 191 Guidelines on Prohibit Political Activity for Classified Members of State Police Service dated April 12, 2018 was issued to remind classified employees of the State Police Service of the do's and don'ts of political activity. This is one of the requirements. Be a member of a private organization that may, under certain circumstances, endorse a candidate for public office so long as the primary purpose of the organization is not the support or opposition of candidates, political parties or factors. However, when the organization does support or oppose a candidate, party or faction, you may not take an active part in the management of the affairs of the organization, even in matters not related to that support or opposition. General Circular Number 191D. The law specifically, the state constitution, the Louisiana State Constitution, Article 10, Section 47, and State Police Commission Rule 14.2 are both clear. No member of the commission and no state police officer in the classified service shall participate or engage in political activity. I also have attached uh, a copy of the committee's report from the uh, Ethics Commission that uh, would, would support my call for an investigation. And I'd like to present that to Mr. Hammond and he can make copies for the committee members. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Miette, thank you for that. Uh, you've submitted two uh, requests for, in, in, I'm sorry, <laughs> yes, you yeah. moved on. You submitted two requests for investigation. One uh, request involves uh, three of the current uh, commission members uh, relative to Rule 16.5 of our rules. Um, I would entertain a motion to order the executive director to conduct an investigation and submit a report of his investigation relative to the complaint against the sitting members of the commission. I move. Second. Okay, relative to the second complaint, a uh, request for an investigation. Oh, we've oh, we got a motion and a second, I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, the, can we, well, the three of us. You might want. Yeah, we, we'll entertain a motion for someone other than Mr. Ricky, myself, or Mr. Well, this is Commissioner Ricky. It's just order of investigation, but yeah, you can Well, I mean, would you make the motion? Would you make the motion? Make the motion? Oh, motion for what? To order <laughs> the commission oh, to conduct the investigation. Make an order to do an investigation on the matter. All right. I'll second. All in favor? Well, I mean, then we're going. <laughs> Do we know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
I thought we did. You want a roll call or you want to just do a? We can do a roll call. Okay, roll call. Jerry Ricky. Yes. Nelson Cantrell. Yes. Jeffrey Falls. Yes. Leonard Nett. Yes. Bill Bree. Yes. I said. Okay. Relative to the second request for an investigation to provide us some opportunity to at least take a look at what is involved. Um, I request that we defer that until our, our next meeting. Do we have a motion? I'll move. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? But we will definitely take a very careful look at that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as I understood your complaint, the action took place after the issuance of our circular? Yes, sir. Right, thank you. Um, everyone, we just had a suggestion. Commissioner Knapp, yes. Uh, with regard to uh, looking at the other chapters of the Louisiana State Police Commission, I would suggest that we uh, start with uh, Chapter 2 and go through uh, do that one next and then uh, subsequently go down in order and look and review all of the uh, just for any, any any changes that we think need to be updated. Mm -hmm. well, what is so definition? What is the definition? What is definition? That that's why I skipped that. Yeah. And we'll do that at the end because we may pick up other definitions as we go through. Okay. That's a great idea. Yeah. Certainly, uh, I would so I don't know. That I, I just yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Any other uh, business? Okay. Well, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you, guys.